emissions forward. Thank you. That brings general questions to an end. And our next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I, I was going to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet last met and what issues were discussed, but <laughs> uh, I think we all know. So let's look at what Hamza Youssef said about the SNP's coalition uh, with the Greens. He described it as worth its weight in gold. Today, it's turned to dust. The Greens have called the ending of the Butte House Agreement as, these are their words, an act of political cowardice by the SNP, accused Hamza Youssef of selling out future generations. They said he has, and again I'm quoting his former colleague's words, broken the bonds of trust with members. They say he has betrayed the electorate. They called the current First Minister weak. For once, have the Greens finally got something right? Yeah. First Minister. Presenting, uh Officer, uh, let me say that uh, what we have achieved with the Butte House Agreement, which, as I've said this morning, has served its purpose, is a record that I will come to very shortly. That Butte House Agreement, of course, that did last and has lasted uh, 969 days, or another way of putting it... <laughs> well, it lasted... Another way of putting it, presiding officer, is it lasted 19 Liz Trusses, presiding uh, officer. It lasted 19 Liz Trusses. And that record of the Butte House Agreement is a record that has seen the railways taken into public ownership, one that has seen free bus travel for those that are under 22, the banning of the most problematic single-use plastics, and of course the increasing of the game-changing Scottish child payment. Let's remind Douglas Ross that our record is one that we can stand on and one that we can be proud of. Can he say that? in stark contrast of a Tory government record that has seen and overseen the biggest fall in living standards on record. A Brexit that has been a complete and utter unmitigated disaster and the worst cost of living crisis in a generation. That's why the Tories are on the brink of an absolute and almighty thumping from the electorate and they deserve nothing less. Douglas Ross. I hope the cameras might be looking at the Greens who all had their head down there and were not applauding. Uh, and let's be clear, the Greens never belonged anywhere near the Scottish Government. Hamza Youssef should have ditched this extreme party on day one of his leadership. But Hamza Youssef said they were worth their weight in gold. In his leadership campaign just over a year ago, he promised to continue the SNP-Green alliance. Just 48 hours ago, he wanted the coalition to continue. This morning, he said it came to a natural conclusion. <laughs> at, at what point in the last 48 hours did it come to its natural conclusion? Or did Hamza Yusuf panic because the extreme Greens were about to jump before he could dump them? First Minister. Officer, let's again look at the... I know Douglas Ross doesn't want to talk about the substance of policy. Let's look at the substance of policy. Over the last year, we, of course, have been the only part of the United Kingdom to avoid pay-related strike action in the NHS. Yep. We've delivered a council tax freeze in every single local authority in Scotland, despite the best efforts of the Conservative Party. We've removed peak fares on our railways, invested record amounts in our NHS, and through our actions, we're, we're estimated to lift 100,000 children out of poverty this year through our actions. And what has Douglas Ross supported over the last year? Douglas Ross and the Tories over the last year have supported the Rwanda bill. Yeah. They've supported tax cuts for the rich. They've supported a doubling down of austerity that is lifting, that is entrenching, I should say, more children, more households into poverty. He's, of course, uh, supported his colleagues in, any, in, in England to give an insulting offer to doctors and nurses who have been left with no option but to go on strike in NHS England. Huge cuts 
to Scotland's capital uh, budget presiding officer. So I'm immensely proud of what my party has achieved, not just over the last few years uh, as part of the Butte House Agreement, but what we've achieved in the last 17 years uh, in government. I bet Douglas Ross and the Conservative Party can't say the same thing about their party. Douglas Ross. Well, the First Minister completely avoided saying what happened in that 40-hour period where he was determined for the coalition deal to continue and now say it's reached its natural conclusion. But I think based on the answers we've just heard, it wasn't practising the lines that he's using today because they are dismal. There is no defence at all. We said from the very beginning this was a coalition of chaos and it has ended in absolute chaos. Hamza Yousaf's government is in crisis. It has unravelled. He has a he has abandoned First Minister, colleagues, I, I, colleagues. I, I, I think the first colleagues. Let's conduct our business in an orderly manner, and let's not shout at one another. I think the First Minister might be a bit tetchy today. I wonder why. <laughs> He has abandoned the platform he stood on. He claims it's now a new beginning, but really it's the beginning of the end. Isn't Hamza Youssef a lame duck First Minister? Yeah. What, First Minister. What an astonishing set of accusations to come from a Conservative. For a Conservative to even utter the words chaos, the party of Boris Johnson, yeah. presiding officer, yeah. the party of Liz Truss, yeah. the party of a Prime Minister that was outlasted by a lettuce presiding officer, yeah. the party of quasi carting, the party of the disastrous mini budget, yeah. the party of Brexit, to utter the words chaos. No wonder Douglas Ross is getting redder and redder and redder, yeah. presiding yeah. officer. They are a party. They are a party presiding officer that have decided time and time again to attack the most vulnerable in our society. They are a party that time and time again have denied climate science. They are a party that has inflamed community tensions. In terms of the Butte House Agreement, yes, we can point to the fact that we've committed £75 million of the 10-year transition fund for the North East of Murray. We can point to free bus travel for the under-22s. We can point to the great strides that we've made in lifting children out of poverty. We can point to the fact that we have some of the most generous grants for clean heat right across the UK. The Tories have not, presiding officer in Scotland, won an election in well over half a century. With Douglas Ross in charge, that ain't changing any time soon. Yeah. <laughs> Douglas Ross. Hamza Youssef described this as a coalition that was worth its weight in gold. He stood on a platform to continue it, and now that deal is broken. This weak First Minister jumped before the, S uh, the Green members pushed him. Even his nationalist colleagues don't trust him. Presiding officer, I can confirm today that on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, I am lodging a vote of no confidence yeah. in Hamza Youssef. <laughs> He is a failed First Minister. He has focused on the wrong priorities for Scotland. He has governed in the SNP's interest and not in Scotland's interest. He is unfit for office. Shouldn't this be the end of the road for this weak First Minister? First Minister. Presiding officer, the Conservatives are nothing if they are not uh, predictable, presiding officer. And here is an opportunity for oppositions to show what they are really made of. Do they want to govern in the national interest? Do they want to Mr. come Ross. together with ideas? Do they want to collaborate? Or are they going to play, as Douglas Ross has demonstrated, political games? And they will be judged very poorly uh, on that. If they want to be judged on their record, let me say it's a record that we and I stand very proud of. The fact that our actions will lift an estimated 100,000 children out of poverty is our actions that, of course, have seen the fact that we've removed peak rail fares from our railways. It's our action that's seen a council tax freeze helping households in the midst of a cost of living crisis. So I'll leave it to Douglas Ross to play the political games that he wants to play. And if he wants to put our record and his gut party's record on the line, let's do that. There's a general election coming this year and I can guarantee you that the electorate will give the Conservative let's Party the an almighty minister. thumping, show them the, do the door and they deserve nothing less. Yeah. 
Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, in 2021, Nicola Sturgeon said the Butte House Agreement meant bold policy action on pressing issues. She told us it would mean a commitment to more affordable housing, a better deal for tenants, steps to accelerate our transition to net zero, and a focus on green jobs. But less than three years on, under his weak leadership, the affordable housing budget has been slashed. New rents are rising faster in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Climate targets have been abandoned. And the only two green jobs created, Patrick Harvey and Lorna Slater's, have now come to an end, just like the Butte House Agreement. But with this government's record of failure and incompetence, people across Scotland will be asking, why have only two ministers lost their jobs today? First Minister. Officer, Anna Sauber asked me about a whole range of uh, climate change related questions. Of course, this is the week where we've just seen consenting uh, an approval for the world's largest commercial uh, round for floating offshore wind. It puts Scotland at the very forefront of offshore wind development uh, globally. Uh, let's also look at Labour's credibility when it comes to tackling climate change. They are, of course, the party that ditched their commitment to invest £28 billion in green energy, giving in to pressure from the Tories, risking squandering Scotland's immense renewable energy potential. Labour in Glasgow used to support a low-emission zone, then, of course, tried to stop it from being introduced. They teamed up with the Tories to oppose workplace parking levy. So whether it's at Westminster, whether it's at Holyrood, whether it's in councils across the country, Labour is guilty of not just the worst type of political cowardice, they are guilty of hypocrisy and, frankly, climate denial when the SNP is taking the action that is necessary. So I say to Anas Sarwar, we will continue to support and take action where necessary to tackle not just the climate crisis, but the nature crisis as well. Wouldn't it be quite something that, as opposed to opposing every measure we take to tackle the climate crisis, that Anna Sawar actually supported it and demonstrated he's serious about taking the, tackling the climate emergency. Anna Sarwar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm happy for Hamza Youssef to delude himself that everything's going well and he's having a great week. Keep it up, First Minister. Um, the First Minister actually spent weeks defending this discredited government and he protests now that if Hamza Youssef won't listen to me, perhaps he'll listen to Hamza Youssef. Because just days ago, he said the Butte House Agreement was worth its weight in gold. He was pleading, I know the Deputy First Minister won't want to hear this, he was pleading Let's the Green Mr. Party Sarwar. members to keep his shambolic government together. I hope that the cooperation agreement will continue. I hope that Green members will also see the benefit of that cooperation. But now he's been forced into a humiliating U-turn, and he knows it. These are his words. I can't imagine being the leader of the SNP and the first thing I do is destabilise the government by going into a minority government. I think that would be a tremendously foolish thing to do. <laughs> Does he feel tremendously foolish today? First Minister. Presiding officer, uh, not content with stealing Tory policies, Anna Sowers now nicking Tory lines, presiding officer, when it comes to the questions that he asks. Let's so, hear officer, the First Minister. This year, Anna Sawar Let's talks about hear the first minister. district principles. Let me remind Anna Sawar about his record of when it comes to his principles. Anna Sawar described lifting the cap on bankers' bonuses when the Tories did it as economically illiterate and morally repugnant. But then, of course, when Keir Starmer does it, Anna Sawar, like a good boy, falls into line. Anna Sawar used to oppose the two-child limit. He now supports Keir Starmer in retaining it. He used to, of course, believe in progressive taxation. He now supports tax cuts for the wealthy at the expense of public services. Isn't it the case, presiding officer, that the only principles Anna Sawar has are those that Keir Starmer tells him he's allowed to have, presiding yeah, yeah. officer? Anna Sawar. Presiding officer, I'm rebuilding my party and looking forward to the next general election. He's destroying his party and wants to run away from a general election. Because this First Minister is claiming that this is all a sign of strength. The louder he shouts, the weaker he sounds. But for once, people agree with Lorna Slater. He is weak, hopeless and untrustworthy. Now, the challenges facing our country have never been so great. But Scotland's government has never been so poor and its leadership has never been so weak. 
One in seven Scots are stuck on an NHS waiting list as he fails to get a grip of the NHS crisis. Families are struggling to make ends meet while this government wastes public money. And green jobs are going elsewhere while he scraps Scotland's climate targets. The people of Scotland can see that the SNP have lost their way. Yeah. They're weak, divided, incompetent and putting party before country. The people of Scotland didn't vote for this First Minister. The people of Scotland didn't vote for this mess and this chaos. So isn't it time to end the circus and call an election? First Minister. Presiding officer, of course, the country will be going to the polls, I hope, sooner rather than later in a general election. Here's the message that each of us will be able to take. I'll be able to look in the eyes, whites of the eyes of the people of Scotland uh, on every doorstep in the country, and I can say that they should be able to vote for a party whose values are the people of Scotland's values. That's through our actions, because our actions are estimated to lift 100,000 children out of poverty. That is a party that has chosen investment in the NHS over tax cuts for the wealthy. A nation where, of course, the only one in the United Kingdom that hasn't had junior doctors or nurses going or strike. Well, Anna Sarwar's party yeah. is the party that would lift the cap on bankers' bonuses, but retain the cap on child benefits. A party that wants to retain the rape clause, a party that wants to spend billions of pounds on the obscenity yeah. of nuclear weapons, not on reducing household poverty. The party that wants to keep Scotland out of the European, uh, European Union. Presiding officer, Anna Sauer used to believe in many of the values that this government believes in. He has, of course, flip-flopped, dumped and ditched those principles because his bosses in London have told him to do. Yeah. That is the height of hypocrisy and the people of Scotland will see through it, presiding officer. Yeah. Question number three, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. <laughs> First Minister. On Tuesday, Presiding Officer. Alex Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you. Uh, the two partners to this failed agreement are at each other's throats. They are now trying to blame each other, but in reality, they have both failed, the people of Scotland. Together, they have cut our NHS off at the knees. They have butchered the housing budget. They have junked climate targets and made life harder for business. Islanders still don't have the ferries they desperately need, and Scottish schools are tumbling down the international rankings. The First Minister is ditching things left, right and centre. Two clowns have left the clown car, but this circus continues. We don't just need, we don't just need an end to the Butte House Agreement. We need an Mr. end to this Mr. entire Cole government. Hamilton. Mr. Cole Hamilton, I will just remind you of the requirement that you treat all members with courtesy and respect. Well, then I, then I apologise, presiding officer. We don't just need an end to the Butte House Agreement. We need an end to this entire government. When will Humza Yusuf finally look at himself in the mirror and say, I'm the problem, it's me? First Minister. That's all I got, a thumping endorsement from the four Liberal Democrat MSPs in this <laughs> chamber, presiding officer. And maybe I should listen to what Alex Cole Hamilton has to say, because if there is a lesson in relation to co coalitions and cooperation agreements, we should probably remember the lesson of the Liberal Democrats presiding officer yeah. when they entered into a disastrous coalition with the Conservatives, yeah. with ushered in 14 years of austerity, that to this day, of course, people are suffering the consequences. Why Alex Cole Hamilton leads a party that couldn't even field a five-a-side football team presiding uh, officer. So what have we achieved as, uh, House, uh, as part of the Butte House Agreement, but also 17 years in government. Well, what we've achieved over the last year is the only part of the United Kingdom to have avoided pay-related strike action in the NHS. We delivered a council tax freeze that's helping households up and down the country. We removed peak fares peak fears on our railways, invested record amounts in the NHS, and through our actions are lifting 100,000 children out of poverty. So when that general election uh, is called by the Conservatives. We'll take our record proudly to every single doorstep in the country. I don't think Alex Cole Hamilton can do the same. Yeah, yeah. Question number four, Kevin Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on NHS Scotland's ability to treat patients in light of the reported scarcity of life saving medicines in the UK due to Brexit. First Minister. Uh, I know reports of medicine shortages are, of course, concerning for patients and their families, so I do thank Kevin Stewart for a really important question. Although these shortages are caused by several factors, such as manufacturing issues, uh, an increase in global demand, a recent report by the Nuffield Trust makes it abundantly clear that the situation has undoubtedly been exacerbated by Brexit and associated loss of European supply chains and authorisations. While the supply of medicines is reserved to the UK Government, I want to reassure the Chamber that NHS Scotland has robust processes in place to manage shortages when they arise. And in most instances, there are alternative products which can be prescribed. I'd encourage anyone experiencing difficulties with shortages to speak to their doctor or pharmacist, and we continue to press the UK Government, the industry and health boards to find a lasting solution to minimise the impact on patients. Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank the First Minister for that answer. In the research by the Nuffield Trust, has revealed that there are shortages in the UK of life-saving medicines such as antibiotics, epilepsy treatments, medicine for ADHD, and vital chemotherapy drugs such as cisplatin and carboplatin, which has all been exacerbated uh, by Brexit and the UK's broken supply chain. Uh, can the F First Minister once again assure the Chamber uh, and the public uh, that the Scottish Government are doing all within its powers to alleviate shortages and ensure that folks get the medicines that they need? And does he share my view that the situation is yet another symptom of the sickness that is broken Brexit Britain? First Minister. Yes, I... I absolutely agree with Kevin Stewart. This is just another example of the disastrous impacts of Brexit. A Brexit, of course, that the people of Scotland simply did not vote for. I do, however, want to reassure and reiterate to members that NHS Scotland does have robust processes in place to manage those shortages when they arise. And in most instances, there are alternative products which can be prescribed. The Scottish Government officials are regularly updated on any supply disruptions and will provide advice to the NHS in Scotland on options to address, address any shortages that may well arise. The Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for Scotland is a member of the UK-wide Medicine Shortage Response Group that has been set up to identify and coordinate responses to any medicine shortages across the UK, providing advice to clinicians on the alternative therapeutic options that exist. As the pricing and supply of medicines is a reserve matter for the UK Government, we will continue to press them to find a lasting solution on minimising the impact on medicine shortages of patients. Jamie Halker johnston uh, Last Saturday, campaigners in Portree protested failures in delivering the recommendations of the Richer Report on health provision on Sky, La Calche and South West Ross. They're calling as a priority for 24-7 uh, for urgent care to be restored at Portree Hospital and the beds that have been lost there to be reinstated. So while recognising that it's NHS Highland that has been unable to deliver on those recommendations, can I ask the First Minister, will he or his Health Secretary, if still in place, agree to meet with campaigners in Portree and hear firsthand their frustrations and their concerns over what those ongoing delays in restoring services means for families and communities in North Sky and how his government will help ensure those recommendations are delivered? First Minister. I'm not sure what that has to do with medicine shortages, but on the point of uh, the actual services that uh, Jamie, Hulk, Jamie Halcrow Johnson uh, raises, of course, I will ensure that the Cabinet Secretary of Health continues to engage uh, with members, continues to engage with NHS uh, Highland. I'm aware uh, of the issue uh, in my time uh, as Health Secretary, and what I can give an assurance to both Jamie Halcrow Johnson uh, and, uh, the con and, and uh, constituents uh, in Sky. Uh, that, uh, of course, we have provided an increase to NHS Highlands uh, budget. We've provided an increase uh, to the NHS, a record over £19.5 billion of funding going to the NHS. That's because, of course, we prioritise investment in the NHS and public services as opposed to prioritising tax cuts for the wealthy, in stark contrast to the UK Conservative government. So I will, of course, ask the Health Secretary to continue to engage with Jamie Halcrow Johnson uh, and, indeed, uh, with NHS Highland. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact he anticipates the Scottish Government's decision to remove the target to reduce emissions by 75% by 2030 will have on infrastructure projects throughout Scotland. 
First Minister. I think Liam Kerr has a brass neck to raise infrastructure projects with me when his Tory colleagues in Westminster are responsible for a £1.3 billion Absolutely. cut to our capital budget to 27 28 Investment in Scotland's infrastructure we know is vital for our sustainable economic future, and investment in net zero brings huge employment and economic growth opportunities. That is why last week we affirmed the Scottish Government's unwavering commitment to deliver net zero by 2045 and announced a whole new package of climate action to, to strengthen our existing bold measures to help achieve and deliver net zero. These include uh, a commitment to uh, publish a new route map for the delivery of approximately 24,000 additional electric vehicle charge points by 2030 through a mix of public and private finance. And our budget has committed substantial uh, funding towards delivery of our climate change goals. Liam Kerr. Well, the First Minister is ignorant of having the largest cash terms block grant in history, of course, and one infrastructure project promised in 2011 to stimulate the economy, reduce emissions and stop the senseless carnage was the duelling of the A96. Now, the Green Party demanded an unnecessary climate review to stall and prevent that, which, having cost £5 million so far, and despite £37 million already spent on preparatory work, will not report until the end of the summer. Now, that the beyond credible targets and the economically illiterate Greens have been jettisoned, can the First Minister concern, confirm that all barriers have been removed from finally, fully duelling the A96? First Minister. Planning uh, Officer, uh, Liam Kerr talked about uh, an unnecessary climate review. It's incredible language when 2023 was the hottest year yeah. on record, yeah. when we've seen extreme weather events, if not by the day, by the week, by the month, right across the world, including here in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And yet Liam Kerr says that it was an unnecessary climate review in the face of all that evidence. That's why the Conservative Party are fast turning in to a party of climate deniers, presiding officer, when what we need, of course, is further climate action, which we will promise to bring forward. And of course, the reality of the situation is that when we look at the real terms, in real terms, there, has been a one, there will be a 1.3 billion cut to our capital budget over the coming uh, year. So we'll continue to invest in infrastructure right across Scotland, as we have done in the North East, be that through the AWPR, new station at Kintore, be that uh, through in health infrastructure in relation to the Baird Family Hospital and other infrastructure projects. We'll continue to do that. But if Liam Kerr had any influence whatsoever, he'd be telling his Conservative colleagues in Westminster to overturn the disgraceful £1.3 billion capital cut. Yes. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer to my voluntary register of interest as I receive support from Stop Ecoside International to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report scoping a domestic legal framework for ecocide in Scotland, which was published by the Environmental Rights Centre for Scotland. First Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting our natural environment to ensure that there are appropriate legal consequences for those who cause significant damage. I know that uh, Monica Lennon is also committed, uh, of course, to that objective. I welcome this report. It's a valuable contribution to the debate on how the law can best achieve this goal. The report demonstrates the complexity of considering a standalone criminal offence of ecocide and will take time to consider the recommendations. The Scottish Government's starting point will be to consider the new European Environmental Crime Directive. The directive requires the introduction of new qualified offences where damage comparable to ecocide has been caused. It is our consistent aim to remain aligned where appropriate with developments in EU law and EU environmental standards. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for his response. It's good to get that on the record, and I'm grateful to members across the Parliament for their constructive cross-party engagement with my Members' Bill proposal on ecocide law uh, for Scotland. Preventing severe environmental harm is vital to protect nature and climate, to support a just transition for workers and communities, and to help our economy deliver for the people of Scotland. In these uncertain times when climate action is needed more than ever, 
Will the First Minister confirm that his government is committed to working with me and all parties and stakeholders on the contribution that ecocide prevention can make, including continuing the positive dialogue I've had with ministers on my Members' Bill? First Minister. Yes, I can uh, commit to continuing to engage constructively uh, with Monica Lennon on this important Members' Bill. I think it is important to say that there have been some challenges that have been aired in relation to designing a new criminal offence, and they have to be considered. I know Environmental Rights Centre for Scotland, the report concludes that, and I quote, there are reasons for Scotland to be cautious before simply integrating the internationally recognised definition into domestic uh, law. I know Monica Lennon is very aware of that, working through uh, these issues. So uh, I do look forward to seeing the detail of Monica Lennon's draft bill. Uh, and of course, uh, we continue uh, to commit to work constructively with her uh, on the detail. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Who does the First Minister think he is pleased most today? Is it Douglas Ross, Fergus Ewing or Alex Salmond? And more to the point, which of them does he think he can rely on for a majority in Parliament now? First Minister. Presenting, presenting officer, obviously Patrick Harvey and I uh, spoke uh, this morning, and I go back to the points and the comments that I made this morning. I do thank Patrick Harvey and Lorna Slater for their contribution to this government, to their contribution to this country, and I think we can take, both take, uh, parties take great pride in what the Butte House Agreement has achieved in almost three years. Let's but it is hear time, the First Minister. It is time for the SNP to govern as a minority government, to reach out on an issue-by-issue -issue basis to other political parties right across this chamber in the best interests of this country. And I believe that there are many issues that unite us, and one of those issues that unite for example, the SNP and the Green Party, one that we will never demure from in any way, shape or form, is that we think all decisions about Scotland are best made by the people of Scotland. Yeah. I call Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. The UK Government's <clears throat> decision to reject out of hand the EU's youth mobility offer to make it easier for people aged between 18 and 30 in the UK to study and work abroad in the wake of Brexit shines a dark light on their ideological obsession of a hard Brexit and a perverse desire to submit to the right wing, with Labour hellbent on an outright outwinging of the Tories on Brexit. Does the FM share my concerns, that, and will he make it clear today that the Scottish Government will continue to fight for the restoration of freedom of movement so that people across the UK can continue to study and work in the EU? First Minister. Officer, uh, Anna Sauer on the front bench is getting extremely agitated by that question. And no wonder, because he's embarrassed by Labour's dismal response to the youth mobility scheme. I would, I would expect a Tory UK government to completely reject the European Commission's, I think, sensible proposal to negotiate a youth mobility scheme. For Labour to do that is just another example of how they're moving away from their principles. What on earth? does the party even stand for if they will not stand for a youth mobility scheme with the European Commission? Yeah. The ending of free movement has damaged the future of our young people, again in Scotland, part of the United Kingdom that did not vote for Brexit. We have long argued that our young people should enjoy the opportunities offered by mobility, such as study and work experience. We urge the UK Government to respond positively to this proposal and to negotiate a deep and generous agreement with the, United, with the European Union. Yeah, yeah. Sue Webber. Sir. First Minister, last week your Government scrapped the Scottish Government's commitment to reducing carbon emissions by 75 per cent by 2030. And the Cabinet Secretary stated, we accept the CCC's recent re-articulation that this Parliament's interim 2030 target is out of reach. We must act now to chart a course to 2045 at a pace and on a scale that are feasible, fair and just. With that in mind, First Minister, the residents of Winchborough presented a position of over 2,000 signatures to your government last week asking for a train station to be built, one that serves their town and the surrounding area, a station that could take almost 500,000 car journeys off the road. Will your government now take the lead and back and build a station at Winchborough? First Minister. 
Clearly, officer, uh, we have a proud record of infrastructure on uh, building on our railways. Uh, that job, though, becomes markedly more difficult when Sue Webber's party takes a hatchet to our capital budget, cutting it about £1.3 billion over the next few years. And when it comes to, of course, uh, ensuring that we take action to tackle the climate crisis. What would be exceptionally helpful if the Conservatives didn't oppose every single measure yeah. we bring forward to tackle the climate crisis? So of course, <laughs> uh, the Transport uh, Secretary, or indeed uh, other members uh, of the government, because she may well be recused from uh, the, the Winchborough decision, uh, will of course look at that, that, that petition uh, that has been uh, brought uh, forward. But I say once again to Sue Webber, our investment in infrastructure uh, is very much hampered by the fact her Conservative government has instructed a £1.3 billion capital cut in real terms to our budget. Yeah. Yeah. Carol Mocken. Thank you, thank you, presiding officer. We have with us care workers in the gallery today, bringing the S2UC's Missing Millions campaign to Parliament. First Minister, can the government hear the workers outside and answer them? Does the Scottish government support the S2UC's Missing campaign? And will this government ever deliver for our essential care workers? First Minister. Well, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health, uh, and Marie Todd, uh, indeed, will both be meeting uh, with uh, care workers. We meet regularly with care workers. It's why, of course, as part of the budget, which I think Karen Mockin voted against, we instructed a pay rise uh, for social care workers, another pay rise for social care uh, workers to £12 an hour. And what I haven't seen from the Labour Party in any budget negotiations, particularly over the course of the last year, was make one suggestion, one costed suggestion of how they would increase the pay of social care workers. In fact, I don't think they've made one single costed suggestion in relation to how we would invest in social care. So we'll continue to invest in our social care workers, engage with our social care workers. And that, of course, is why the National Care Service and getting some, getting some support from the Labour Party around that would be most helpful, because it will increase the terms, conditions of social care workers right across the country. John Mason. Hey, thank you. Can I ask the First Minister what the government's reaction is to the recommendation that local councillors should be paid £24,500 from the 1st of April? First Minister. Presiding officer, uh, we will, of course, uh, look and consider the recommendations of the Independent Scottish Local Authority Remuneration Committee in partnership with COSLA. It's important that appropriate consideration and deliberation is applied and a response will be published uh, in uh, due course. I can confirm uh, that councillors have already received a 6.2% uplift for 24-25 through the current uh, legislation. And I would, uh, of course, uh, ask, say to members to, to, to refer to my register of ministerial interest, where my wife uh, is currently a serving councillor. Brian Whittle. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. On a visit to Presswick Airport by the Economy and Fair Works Committee this week, we learned that the engineering cluster that includes the airport and surrounding companies are burgeoning at the seams and are desperate to expand. However, there is a severe shortage of apprentices. This is also a message from potential investment from HLCC at Hunterston. Ayrshire College is very keen to deliver the apprenticeships required, but have had the apprenticeship funding cut. There is now £84 million of public funding put back into the pot with the demise of the Mangata uh, proposal at Presswick. That was an investment from the Esher Growth Deal. Through the Regional Skills Initiative, does it not make sense to redeploy this money, invest in the Ayrshire College Apprenticeship Programme and solve the issues that Ayrshire's engineering works are facing? First Minister. Can I say to Brian Whittle, uh, he does raise a very important point uh, indeed, and I'm grateful to him for raising it in uh, the Chamber. In terms of the Ayrshire growth deal, that will then be a decision, of course, for all of the partners uh, as part of the Ayrshire growth deal. I do thank Brian Whittle. He's made a suggestion that is well worth uh, exploring, uh, in, particularly in relation to the funding for apprentices. We know how valuable uh, they are, how valuable the apprenticeship scheme is. So uh, Brian Whittle has, has made a suggestion in this chamber. I promise him that we'll take a look at that. And local uh, uh, partners, as part of the Ayrshire Growth Deal, I would encourage them to also take a look at the suggestion that Brian Whittle uh, has made. And let's see if we can find a resolution. Daniel Johnson. 
In recent days, there have been worrying reports regarding Scottish Government delays in allocating employability funding. Failure to confirm funds to local authorities for the No One Left Behind programme is having a devastating impact on training organisations. Mm -hmm. Forty people across the sector have already been made redundant, with many more at risk if funding is not released quickly. Skills and employability systems should be about creating opportunities, not making people redundant. So what commitment can the First Minister give to training providers and those they seek to help uh, as to when this crucial funding will be released? First Minister. Well, I'll take uh, an immediate look at the particular example that Daniel Johnson raises in this Parliament. Of course, employ we have a good record on employability uh, grants over the years, the apprentices that have been created, the employability opportunities that have been created, particularly for some of the most marginalised groups in our society. And of course, it is important those grant letters uh, get out the door as soon as possible uh, so that the situation that Daniel Johnson mentions does not transpire. So we will take a look at the specific example that Daniel Johnson has raised and I'll make sure the appropriate Cabinet Secretary writes that. Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, there is a well-established business in West Linton supplying log-burning stoves and accessories. Very concerned that after 30 years the business may very well be under threat. I understand that clean eco-design wood-burning stoves with locally su supplied wood can be used in conjunction with other renewable energy heating options. And this is supported, I understand, by a government study just a few years ago. Can I ask the First Minister to ask the appropriate Cabinet Secretary to revisit that study, as this may affect other small rural businesses? First Minister. Yes, I, I will, uh, of course, uh, ensure that we continue to keep uh, those uh, regulations under uh, review. What I would say to Christine Graham, of course, there are appropriate, uh, we know, exemptions uh, in place, and we do take account of unique circumstances, particularly in rural and island Scotland. So I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to take a look at the detailed uh, case that uh, Christine Graham raises and write back uh, with uh, some of that detail and provide an update to Christine Graham. Finlay Carson. The Rural Divide is a new report by the charity Change Mental Health, which reveals the stark inequalities facing children and young people in rural Scotland when accessing mental health care services. In NHS Dumfries and Galloway, some 44% of children and young people were not seen by CAMS within the 18 week of referral. This report shows us once again that children and young people in some of our most rural areas aren't getting the support they need and when they need it. The First Minister has overseen closure of our rural hospitals closure of our rural maternity services and the industrialisation of our rural landscape. His government has repeatedly failed rural Scotland and now his government is letting down young folk in our rural communities. Will the First Minister commit to delivering targeted action to tackle these significant rural mental health inequalities? First Minister. We have, of course, uh, under this government, uh, not just double investment in mental health, we've, of course, ensured that we've recruited more and more staff, record levels of staff, uh, in uh, CAMS and the mental health uh, services. So we've got, a, again, a proud track record of investing in mental health. We know there's challenges, particularly as we recover our services post the global pandemic. Uh, Organisations like Change Mental Health are very important uh, uh, right across uh, the country. But I will ask uh, the Minister's responsibility for mental health to write to Finlay Carson around the actions we are taking uh, nationally, but also locally, in order to support people who are facing some difficult challenges with their mental health. Emma Harper. Um, First Minister, news research from HMRC has shown that thousands more taxpayers moved to Scotland than left each year in the period after Scottish income tax was introduced. This seems to be somewhat at odds with the warnings from the Tories and even some Labour members that progressive taxation would deter taxpayers from coming to live here. Does the First Minister agree that this confirms that Scotland is an attractive place to live and work, with a progressive approach to tax taxation that raises additional funds for public services? First Minister. I do agree, uh, I do agree uh, Presiding Officer, with that, and it flies in the face of some of the rhetoric that we hear from the opposition. Yeah. The opposition claiming, of course, that uh, the fact that we have progressive tax would somehow lead to an exodus of Scots. What the HMRC data has shown, of course, is that more people from the rest of the United Kingdom want to come to Scotland as opposed to those who are leaving Scotland. And I can tell you one thing, Presiding Officer, the opposition absolutely hate that fact. And the simple fact is that people choose to live and work on a range of factors, not just tax. In Scotland, people have access to a range of services that simply don't exist 
elsewhere in other parts of the UK, such as free prescriptions, such as, of course, free access to higher education. And that latest HMRC data confirms an average of 4,200 more taxpayers coming to Scotland from the rest of the UK than left since 2017-18. In 2021-22, the latest year of data, net migration of taxpayers has improved, and this is crucial, across all tax bans. Yeah. And £200 million in additional taxable income was brought into Scotland. It's for others, of course, to set out how slashing taxes, running down our public services, would make Scotland a better place to live, work, study and do business in. I don't think that's the case. Yeah, yeah. Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, I chaired a meeting with a campaigners and businesses representative on anti-racism in the workplace. I was disappointed to hear that so many in our businesses and our public organisations felt unable to report the racial abuse they faced at work. Can the First Minister outline what measures the Scottish Government is taking to empower people to report racial abuse in the workplace? First Minister. Well, can I thank uh, Faisal Chowdhury for raising an exceptionally important uh, question. And also, of course, at the time before he was a member of the Scottish Parliament, he was raising these issues as chair of LREC and other such organisations consistently over the years. So he's been a, a tireless campaigner against racism uh, and hatred of any form uh, over, the ma over many years. Um, in terms of the actions we're taking, I'm, I'll ensure the Cabinet Secretary for Justice writes to voice or Chaudhry with the detail. But that's why, for example, third-party reporting centres are really important. And they've had some misinformation and disinformation over the weeks and months of the importance uh, of why they exist. They are important because some people may not quite feel as confident reporting directly to the police. Now, we have to remove those barriers, dismantle those barriers where they exist, and third-party reporting centres can play a role in that. But I will ask the appropriate Cabinet Secretary uh, to write to Voice of with the detail of what we're doing so that everybody feels safe in the workplace to be able to report racism wherever it exists. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Liam Kerr, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the debate begins.